Good morning. How you doing? Darlene, where's she at? Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I mean, that puts some life in. Great, some churches don't have a piano player. So, oh, King James Bible, John. Hmm. Okay, got that all squared away. Make sure that's right. And um, let's see. Oh, and then Dave Finn. This is my chess partner. All because the time I preached, I said, anybody play chess? He had the guts to raise his hand. <laughs> and we've got about, what, 30 games in? I've only won one. <laughs> one? No, you've won a couple. I remember every one you've won because they slaughtered me. It was terrible. I never call him back after he beats me for a while. You know, I said, oh boy, I don't think I can take that kind of damage anymore. And I want to introduce you to my lovely wife, Vicki. This is Vicki. You've got to stand big. You can say, say hi to everybody. Yes. And we've been married 25 years. Doubled. And then some. We're there, aren't we, babe? Yeah. Okay. That's good. And I noticed, I noticed something that Patty did that was so nice. Where's Patty? Did she leave? Did she leave already knowing what I was going to preach? Or what? There you are. She did something that stunned me. Stumped me. I mean, she put on the back my, my, my introduction and left blanks in it. I couldn't figure out what the blanks were. <laughs> so we're in big trouble. But that's all right. That's always an interesting thing to do. It keeps your attention somewhat, right? So, um, uh, I, you know, I'm going to do something that's a, a little different on my introduction, I, because this, this is kind of an attention getter, you know, keeps people focused and things like that. That's cool. It, it's kind of distracted me, though, because I can't remember. Whatever. I'll get back to it. And, uh, but I want you to turn to Matthew. I want to ask you a question. Okay, Matthew um, 2018, or I can't remember. I'll find it. The Great Commission. Which one is that? Somebody tell me. Matthew what? 28. There we go. All right. This is just for an opening and then we're going to pray. Just, just, it's different. It's not having to do with the sermon. Of course, the Great Commission has to do with every sermon I ever give. If we're not doing the Great Commission, I don't know what we're here for. So, if we're not reaching out with the gospel to each other and to the lost then we're not in the business of what we're called to do. How we do that? Well, there are many kinds of programs and those kinds of things. But I'm asking you this question because I know you're used to word puzzles and things like that. And, and so I figured I'd get your attention with something like that. What is the verb that you think is the most important? Now, there are important verbs in these two verses, 19 and 20. And we don't take too much time. Just take a look at 19 and 20. You probably got it memorized. Just take a quick look. Uh, I'll read it, baby. You want me to read it? You got your phone, I'll read it for you. And what is the most important verb that you see um, uh, in 18, 19 to 20? Most important verb. This is a quiz. I know what it is. No, there's no right answer. I said, okay, you have your reasons why you pick. Here it is. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. All right. Who wants to take a risk? And tell me what you think is the most important verb. What do you say? Teaching. Huh? Teaching. Teaching. All right. You, that's good. Teaching. Yeah, we got to teach, right? No. Go. 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 Yes, that's usually the first one that comes right up, right? Other one? Make disciples. Make. Make disciples. Good. Excellent. Any others? I'm so proud of you guys. That is so good. I was, we're, I'm doing a discipleship program with a bunch of men. At least I'm part of it. There's somebody else overseeing it. And they asked that question. And I was the only one who chose a different verb. Everyone else chose the verbs you chose. And then the guy, then the guy even knowing my, knowing my ability to handle criticism, he went up there and said, Steve, I have no idea. No, I, I, he goes all over, all over the state doing this question. And he, he said, no one has ever picked the verb you picked. I'm thinking, wow, 
But I didn't feel guilty at all. And so what verb did I pick? I mean, all you guys picked the right ones. I mean, go, make, and what teaching, you know? And I picked um, given. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, therefore, go therefore, go ye therefore. What's the therefore for? What's the therefore therefore? Why? Therefore, therefore go. What's the basis of our going? What's the strength of our going? It's given. What was given? What was given is all authority. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. If we don't have that verb, then the other verbs don't work. Because it's by his power, by his strength, and that's the reason why you guys are going to be able to get up and go and be here in church tonight. By his power, by his strength, right? Uh, how, how long do you spend on that sermon? How long did you spend on your sermon this week? Four or five days, six days. Yeah, six days. And he's, you're younger than I am, right? You're quite a bit younger than me. I can spend six days and still not get a sermon. It's hard work. A lot of prayer. A lot involved. Body of Christ comes together. Here's the word. United together in Christ. Knowing that all authority is given to Jesus. And therefore we go, we make. And then the end it says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Um, Lynn had mentioned that there's some social problems going on. I haven't noticed. I have noticed. And for us to go, go and make disciples and teach without the authority of Christ is ludicrous. Can't be done. But it can with him. All things are possible. And he will bring it together. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, we depend completely on the Holy Spirit here. We, we pronounce the word. We study the word. We try to organize it in such a way that it can be maybe absorbed and brought to the minds of people. But Lord, it's not the mind. It's the heart. It's the heart that needs to look into the word. It's the heart that needs to be moved by you. And we ask by your grace that you would illumine the preaching of the word, illumine the written word, and illumine our hearts that we might receive the message that might be shuffled up in all kinds of stuff. But that the message, the central message of this word would come to our hearts so that we might be moved to go forth and proclaim your glory to a world that is desperate for you. And we know we go with your authority and that you are always with you, us and you never forsake us. We pray for Lynn tonight as he comes to preach. And the time he spent in the word, no doubt filled with prayer, filled with hope, praying for people in this church, praying for the country, knowing that the solution, the only solution is not on one aisle or the other aisle, one party or another party. The only solution is the party, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is your son, Jesus Christ. That is where the power is. And everything that we face today is by your hand, by your power. And Lord, you have brought us together to glorify you to a nation that desperately needs you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to be in Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. Um, it's clearly for... It is clearly for, it seems it's like Isaiah, how many of you are familiar with Isaiah 53? Just about everybody in the world gets preached uh, Isaiah 53 sometime around Easter. And, um, well, if you're not familiar with it, let me see here. Hang on. Let's see what I did with that. There it is. No. Nope. The bulletin. There we go. Ah, here you go. Yeah, if you're not familiar, you're familiar with this, right? Because I didn't see a lot of hands go up, but you're familiar with this. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. How many are familiar with that? Okay, good. Oh, good. I, I know how most of you feel. I've got a little bit of arthritis. and it's Hard to get them up. And, but, um, uh, so that's what we're going to be. 
looking at those uh, as well. And of course, we're going to be looking at Acts 8. We have to um, as we look at Isaiah. How many remember what's in Acts 8 that's related to Isaiah 53? I do this because many churches where I go, and I don't go to many churches, but the ones I go to have some children. So I'm always asking them Bible questions that they get in their Sunday school. And so, anyway, that's all right. I'll tell you what that's going to be. I've entitled the sermon, now knowing that unre- Isaiah 53 is, seems to be for unredeemed believers. One of the crucial things that we forget as a church is that I'm pausing because I want you to get this. Redeemed believers need the gospel. I say that because I have run into a number of people who have been in churches for a number of years, older people like me, and when the gospel is preached, they look at me and they actually say, I don't need the gospel. I got the gospel when I was 19 years old. And I say in my heart, you didn't get the gospel. The gospel is all through your life. Remember, salvation involves justification in which you are judicially made righteous because of what Christ has done. But it also involves sanctification. The same faith that justifies is the same faith that sanctifies through the same gospel centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. And even our glorification is involved with the gospel. Your hope right now as you look to the future, your hope as you look at the things that Lynn were talking about that we see over and over, your hope is in the gospel. Your hope is in the glory of the gospel in the future. Your hope is in the gospel now. Your hope has been built on the gospel in the past. You've been saved from the punishment of sin, justification. You're saved from the power of sin, sanctification. You're saved from the presence of sin, glorification. That's all gospel. So I had that happen to me a couple of times. It happened to me the other day. Older guy looked at me and said, I don't need the gospel. If we don't need the gospel, then we're not going to be able to proclaim it because we don't know the true fullness of its glory. So we need to know, we need to, and I hope that's not in your mind. I don't think it would be. It wasn't mine for a number of years preaching. Oh, yeah, gospel's just for believers, uh, unbelievers. They come forward. All right, they got come forward. The rest of us say, oh, praise the Lord, they got saved. As if the gospel has no meaning to us. Do you realize the gospel is written in the Bible mostly to Christians? Letters to churches? The gospel is laid out clearly to churches, to saints, people, well, saints that are sinners, saints. So the gospel is for the believer. So, I, so uh, I have entitled this sermon from Isaiah 53, Good News for the Christian or A Man of Sorrows for Our Joy. A man of sorrows for our joy. Joy for those who embrace the gospel and are justified and made righteous in the sight of God because of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Made righteous and joy to us who are being made righteous in the likeness of Christ. By the gospel. And and when we get that, when we get that understanding, then giving the gospel to someone is not as hard. Because we're given to us, every, ourselves, every day. Every day we're embracing the gospel, the glory of the gospel. So, now every Christian needs to be cautious in the necessity to remember Jesus, the suffering servant. And that's how we would title Jesus in Isaiah 53. We as Christians are encouraged by the truth of Isaiah 53. And I'm just going to give that to you up front. This is where you can fill in your little blanks. This is kind of introductory. Okay. If you, want to fill, if you want to fill them in, but best is if you, because you'll forget to fill in. But what you won't forget is the contrast that goes to your heart. Here's the contrast. This is the good news. This is the blessedness of Isaiah 53 to believers as well as unbelievers. Christ was despised. We are esteemed. Christ was despised. Picture that, because we're going to go over that a little bit. He was despised, hated, rejected, 
And out of that, we were esteemed, lifted up. That contrast, if you grab hold of that and just reflect upon that as you see yourself as missionaries going into our world that we've loved so much in our country, we see these things happening that have been happening throughout the centuries, but now they're just kind of closing in on us a little bit. That's the kind of thing we have, a message we've been esteemed, we're sinners esteemed. Christ was pierced and crushed. We were, you want to play the game? Start with H. Healed. <laughs> I don't want to trust you. We were healed. Christ bore our iniquities and we are counted righteous. And like the redeemed Ethiopian eunuch, in these things, we rejoice. And we're going to talk about the Ethiopian eunuch here in a moment. Now, before we enjoy the blessing of Isaiah 52, 13, and 53, 12, and I'm, we should be able to get through it relatively rapidly. Um, let's go look at the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. You can follow along. I'm just going to tell the story. And by the way, Jim, Jim, you can tell a story like that. I'm, next time John calls me, I'm going to say, John, you don't need me. You got Jim. Doesn't he know how to tell a story? And does he not have in his heart God, the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I appreciate John inviting me to come. He feels sorry for me. But, but you know what I always enjoy? I enjoy most in my church, and I enjoy it when a pastor picks one of our... Of course, Jim is as old as I am, but he doesn't look it, but whatever. He's younger. But, you know, have somebody in your church preach. Who, who in here has been here? How many of you have been a Christian more than 30 years? How many have been in this church, say, 10 years? At least 10 years. Okay, well, you have relatively new people. How long have you guys been in? Ed, you've been here forever. So, so think about it. How many verses you've heard? How many, how many passages you've heard preached? What does it take for you to just take a time and pray about a, a unit of Scripture and just come up here and talk about it? I mean, there's a lot of maybe things you could put in a sermon, not a sermon. But there's so much of you here that have known the Lord so long that this is a place where you can also exercise that proclamation. So, anyway, so we're going to the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, there's a guy named Philip. I really love him. There's two Philips. One is an apostle, and the other is, and I really love this guy, he's a deacon. And in Acts uh, chapter 6, after the church got settled in, they got so overwhelmed with all kinds of duties and problems, they went out and chose seven deacons. And one of those deacons was Philip, and he also had a gift of evangelism. And so he was transported and moved about and going places, evangelizing with the gospel. And the reason I like him is because so many people think the Great Commission is only for pastors or leadership in the church. But to remember, deacons are, if you have this idea that there's a difference between laity and non-laity, whatever that is, if you have that idea, I came out of church, I'm still in the church. And the Great Commission is to every one of us. And so here's Philip. He's exercising the Great Commission. He's traveling along and an angel comes to him and says, Philip, I need you to go to Gaza, some place just outside Jerusalem, a desert place. I need you to go there. And he rose. And behold, a man. There was a man there as Philip arrived. He was, I believe, in a caravan because he was the head of the treasury for the Queen of Ethiopia. Um, and so I imagine he had a few people around there protecting his money and whatever he had but he was in a chariot it seemed as he was in a chariot by himself moving along and he had great authority he was under candace the queen and and he had come to worship he apparently either was a proselyte or a jew and he'd come to worship to jerusalem and he was leaving heading back home and he's returning and like you he was sitting somewhere reading his bible in this case he was reading in his chariot reading isaiah out loud 
And the Spirit said to Philip, go, go, go to that chariot. And Philip ran to the chariot. I have no idea why he ran. I would have walked. Because I can't run. But he ran. He ran to the chariot. I, I, I visualize it. Possibly there was something that he was reading that he wanted to catch at that very moment. So he ran up to the chariot. And he heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And then he looked up and he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Have you ever run into a person you've known closely and dearly to you and you've given the gospel over and over and they don't understand what they're reading? what I do? I'm innocent. I did nothing. Sabotage. <laughs> Have you ever run into that? I've had friends and relatives like that. And they don't say what he said. The Ethiopian eunuch follows up and says, how can I accept someone guide me? How can I accept someone show me? You got relatives, you have friends, you have neighbors. They read it. They get, uh, I don't get it. How can they? Except someone who has the spirit will show them. And if you've done that enough, you have a lot of sympathy pour out of your heart. It's like working with a child who may have some disabilities and you're trying to help them and, and, they're, and they're desperate to learn and they want to know and they want to get on their feet and they're, and they're angry because they can't get on their feet. That's the way the world is. They turn to everything they possibly can to get satisfaction. They don't understand where to turn. And we ask ourselves, where's the Great Commission? Where's the church? And are they moving out to give the word? To give understanding. So he asked Philip, how can, I, how can I accept someone to show me? And he asked Philip to come up into the chariot. And this is the place in the scripture that we read that he was reading. 32 to 33. The place of the scripture which he read in Acts 8 was, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Now the Ethiopian eunuch, you and I, we look at that. Hey, we got that figured out. Well, of course, if we do our proper hermeneutic, we go to the Old Testament. You don't see Jesus' name written in this passage at all. And you look at the historical element, I guess the, the, the servant could be Israel or the servant could be Isaiah, but there's ways to eliminate that option. But in the New Testament, we have the Old Testament revealed. We can gain understanding of the progressive revelation in the Bible of the Old Testament through what the New Testament says. That's you. That's Philip. Those of you who have that context, you read those two verses there. This is Jesus. He came as a lamb, dumb before the shearers. In humiliation, in his judgment, he was taken away. And who, who shall declare his generation? His life is taken from the earth. Wow, we know who that is. But we have support of who that is because we can go to this passage in Acts 8, New Testament, which says it's Jesus. All right? We have no, no problem with that. And Philip opened his mouth again and began the same scripture, preached to him Jesus. So he took this Old Testament passage and he preached to him Jesus. Here's one for you. I'll just throw this out there. I throw it out there because just like the, I believe the, the Great Commission, the gospel was for, for unregenerate people only. I also had this kind of belief in, that, you know, you just look at the context, historical, cultural context, literary context of a passage. And you do, absolutely must do that. You have to know what it says to the original writers, original people, and what it applies to the original people, and then bridge it to what it applies to us. You have to do that. But one thing I left out, 
over the years, which to my regret, which you don't have to do anymore if you don't believe me, is not only do you have that historical context, cultural context, literary context, the context, the immediate context of the Bible and the remote context of it, also you have the redemptive plan that flows throughout the entire Bible and therefore you can find Jesus on every page. Now Jesus may not be mentioned, there are other ways to make that bridge to the redemptive plan of God, but if we do not, if we give, do this, do that, be better at this, be better at that, and we don't give the gospel, we give them nothing except legalism. And the only thing that will free your children and free friends that are trapped into some sort of legalistic approach is to not only get the word of God as we see it, but to see the redemptive application in every passage that points everyone to Jesus. That's the Great Commission. And that means the Old Testament as well. Now I want you to hold that, put it in a drawer someplace, pull it out later and think about it. If you may be in the same camp that I've been in for years. Never had an idea that there's one central story in the entire Bible and it's the redemptive plan of God through Jesus Christ. It is the hope and it's what transforms us. Not only are we justified, but we are transformed by receiving and reviewing and remembering the gospel. As we went on their way, they came to Waterhole. Now, I love this part. I don't know how you do baptisms in here. I know that I've seen various Baptist churches do it different ways. Baptism, um, well, I'll just tell you the way I did it. I guess I'm confessing all the wrong things I've done. Uh, about getting old, sometimes I did wrong things, and now I just do more wrong things. But still, I, I would do things like, well, if you're going to be baptized, you've got to be a member of the church. But then again, since I'm a congregational church, I'm not sure I want you to be in the church yet. <laughs> because you're going to make meetings, you're going to make decisions and motions. You may not have reached a maturity, and I may not want you making all that opinion yet. So I think I'll hold off baptism for a year until we get a chance to do membership classes and things like that. That doesn't seem to be the pattern here. And if you, you've, you guys don't remember Joe Boyd, I can't believe it. And Pastor Sturk mentioned it the other a couple of weeks ago. He mentioned Joe Boyd again. How many of you remember Joe Boyd? All-American athlete. He'd get up here. He'd been here several times. John would have him all the time. I took him down to Quincy once in one time. He's kind of a shock, really, was. He's with the Lord now. But he would stand up here and he'd say, okay. I'm going to give the message and we're going to have the baptism. Then he'd look at John and he'd say, you got the baptismal waters warmed up? He wouldn't even give me any warning. And John just kind of hesitated like I would have too, you know. But look at this guy here. Look at what the Ethiopian eunuch does. He says, um, here's water. Here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And then the response was, well, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. Now, some would question in some manuscripts whether that verse is there, but it's in ours, that's for sure. And it also was echoed throughout the Bible that we believe, and then we're baptized. If you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. Then he said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. No sinner's prayer, no necessarily confession of sin, but he heard the message, and he looked at it, and he said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God of God and all the ramifications of what that meant in the context of what this evangelist Philip the deacon had communicated to him and then in 38 39 and he commanded the chariot to stand still and they went down both into the water both Philip and the eunuch he baptized him and when they were come up out of the water the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way what? Rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Now that is the image that we need to put in our hearts for all these crazy things that seem to be going out here for those very people causing those crazy things who are in such, such fear really and who are so sorrowfully unfamiliar with the Bible that they desperately need the Spirit to receive the Word so that they might come to know Jesus and walk away rejoicing. That's 
what we do. That's who we are. You say, well, that's kind of hard. Somebody might throw a brick at me. Yeah, probably more likely today than before. That's closing in on us. And we take certain precautions or whatever. But somehow we have people in our own little circle that we can go to and talk to and give this wonderful gospel. So there's some concerns. Who, for those who are on the pathway through justification and are traveling on progressive sanctification like you are, there are concerns of wonderfully, that being wonderfully destined to glorification. Every Christian needs to be cautious in the necessity to remember Jesus. Well, don't we do that on our communion? Remember? And do we remember Jesus and our devotion to us? That great salvation that he's given us? I want you to turn to 1 Peter. 2 Peter, excuse me. I have to turn there because I'm going to read a passage. And I want you to see the importance of remembering Hey, don't worry, I can stop this message any time now because you got everything I want to say almost. Okay? So, I think you have the challenge in the heart. It wasn't in the outline. But I hope that you had in your mind someone who suffers, that you have sympathy for, who strives in this world, who needs the hope of Christ. If that's in your mind, this message is done. And if your heart is such that I've got to find a way to reach that person with the love of Christ. If that's there, we, we got it. All right? You just come forward, bow, a prayer, whatever. We've got it done. But I want you to see the reason why it's so important to remember. And go to 2, Timothy, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And, and I'm going to read some things about our sanctification. How do we become better? We become better by by our own personal discipline, that doesn't work. This one is part of it, but it's discipline that grows out of what Christ does in your heart through the gospel. It is a faith that brings you to the love of God so genuinely that you cannot help but obey. That is a faith that that's obedience that belongs to faith. It's not that they give you a list of things to do and you go out and don't. The list is right there in the Bible, but the means of doing those things is through the gospel and the grace of God. We grow by grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 So here, I'm just going to read this to you, and I want you to see what happens in your sanctification to you. And, what it is, and if it's not there, if these elements are not in your life, then I want to show you this passage is going to show you why not. Even though you're a Christian, they may not be in your life. They're not mine, all of them, that's for sure. i got to say that because my wife's here. She knows who I really am. Don't you, babe? I'm in big trouble. So here we go. According to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to the glory and virtue, whereby we are given unto, he has given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That's all involved in the gospel. That by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. Now that diligence, we're going to see how that diligence happens in a moment. Because pure diligence doesn't do it. You'll see. Well, we all know that. We're old enough to know that our thought life isn't what we'd like it to be. Our attitudes to our neighbor is not always what we want it to be. We turn in ourselves and we look to God and repent and we know that all our sins have been covered. He's paid for them all, past, present, and future. And that we are secure in Christ because of Christ alone. So it says, the diligence to add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance and temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness. Now, this is a good place to say, this is what you need to do. You need to be godly, you need to be patient. You need to be temperate. 
He didn't have brotherly kindness. What's the matter with you? Could do that, right? But that's not the way it works for us. We're sinners saved by grace. We grow by grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we grow. We don't grow by doing apart from Christ. We grow by doing by the power of Christ. He enables us. He gives us the heart and burden and changes us in that way. Brother to kindness, charity. And these things be in you and abound. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's where the fruit comes from. Get this virtue. Get this virtue. Add it to your faith. But he that lacketh these things is blind. Why? You guys know 2 Peter 1, 9? He is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He has forgotten. And what's the cure that will lead us to virtue, that will lead us to be missionaries and reach people around us. How do we get that virtue? By remembering. Not forgetting. By remembering being purged from our old sins. Well, how are we purged from our old sins? This is talking to Christians. The gospel. The truth about Jesus Christ who died and was buried and rose from the dead. Wherefore, and I just want to read the rest of this to give you the fruit of this. Wherefore, uh, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth, the gospel. Okay, so I made that point. And I, I read that for the, for the reason, so we can look quickly into Isaiah now, for things to remember, okay, that we need to remember. And I can't, and don't worry, um, Lynn, those hands are always in the same place when I'm here. Do they ever move? Does that say five after 11? No way. Is that what it says? And what time does your service stop? Normal standards are past John's. Oh, well now that I understand that. <laughs> what is Pastor Jan's standard? It's 12-15 minutes in scriptures and just haven't found it yet. 12-15? 12-15? Well, it's only 11-5 right now. Right? He's just kidding, right? He's got to be kidding. You guys would go to lunch. <laughs> all right, we, that's all right. We're just going to go through this quickly because there's some things we see in Isaiah that we need to remember uh, that will draw us to ministry by his strength. First of all, we remember Christ laid down his life for us. Christ laid down his life for us. You already knew that. Verse 13, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. And this just simply says Christ is the victor. He has victory, great care. He does this with great care and concern. He's prudent. And he shall rise up victoriously and shall be gloriously praised. And then verse 14 says, As many were astonied. There's a good word for you. Astonished in some translations. When I looked up astonied, it said a deer in the headlights. <laughs> Stunned. Didn't say that, but as I look at the definition. In verse 14, And many were astonied at, the, at his visage, or his face, was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. So much so that his own wounds would eventually kill him. And then, because Jesus, remember, Christ laid down his life for you. He laid down his life for you. If he laid down his life for you, is it not good? Not to put any guilt on us, but isn't it a wonderful gift to give to the Ethiopian eunuch? Christ laid down his life for you. And then, 
Uh, verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them uh, uh, shall they see. That, that his, his ministry was overwhelming to the point to create silence. And that which they had, the kings, that which they had not heard shall they consider. That, that Jesus was in the face of history, in the face of that time, of what was happening to him, his being beaten and his influence that shut the mouths of kings. And in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. That's talking about Jesus. Yet he opened not his mouth. He brought his, as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. So in his death, he comes and does not object. I want to move on and get that. But the first thing that we um, remember is that Jesus died for us. And I, and I just want to quickly say this. I got it written down here. But, you know, it says that this is a commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. And we see here how Jesus loves us. He gave his life for us. And he loves us. And we, because of that, because of that, we love him. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. And the great commandments are, the greatest commandments are, love God with all your heart and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. But where do we ever get empowered to love some of the stuff we're seeing happen out here? But yet Jesus says the kind of love he has is a love that loves enemies. A love that has sympathy for what we see around us. You see, we're the movers here. Not the politics. Not the president. Not the Congress. Christ is the mover. And we are in Christ and he is in us. We're the movers. We're the ones who have the authority through Jesus alone. We have the power through Jesus. Does, do we, are, are we under the impression that some government has a power that is equal to God? Well, Isaiah would tell you, no. All the nations are like a what? Drop in the bucket compared to him. And he is the one who indwells us and he indwells his church. All right. Remember why he died. Why did he die? This is quick. Why did he die? Because the wages of sin is death, and you're a sinner. And he died to take your place in full. Pay the price in full. Any sin you commit in the past is paid for. Any sin you commit now is paid for. Any sin you commit in the future is fully paid for. He has paid the debt in full. And to say otherwise, by our humility, saying, oh, I shouldn't have done that. God's not going to save me anymore. That infringes upon the glory of who Christ is and what he has done. And it's important to embrace that truth or you will not grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to embrace the truth emphatically. Someone comes to you, maybe a dear relative who knows you sinned in a way that you're ashamed of and they point the finger at you along with the devil accusing you. And your answer is, and it must be this. It's covered. Some would say, well, if it's covered, I guess we'll just go out and do anything we want to. That's spoken from people who don't know Christ. We who know Christ and have Christ in us, yes, we're broken, but we are not going to sin so willfully for the one who, since we know the one who came to us died for our sins. We are not given that kind of heart. Yes, we will sin. But it's covered. And when we, when we understand it is covered, then we have a powerful message to give to one another and to the world. It is covered. So, why did he die? Verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He bore our griefs and sorrows. Verse 5, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. We have peace, reconciliation because of his work, not because of ours. And with his stripes we are healed. 
And the Lord, and in verse 6, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, taken care of, paid for. He died, Christ died for our sins. Next week, you'll get the resurrection. He shall bear their iniquities, our iniquities. He was numbered with the transgressors in verse 12, and he bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for our transgressions. The word that I always love this passage, since I listened to all of grace by C.H. Spurgeon, I listened to it to relax almost every twice a week. All of grace by C.H. Spurgeon. Just a wonderful presentation of the gospel. And he tied me in and he went a whole chapter. And God came to save the ungodly. God came to save the ungodly. And he goes to this verse, for when we were yet without strength, we had no strength in ourselves, not even a brain to really think rightly about God. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Us and our buddies out there who really need Christ and really need the love of God through us to be administered. And that can't happen until we understand how much God loves us. Remember, Christ was despised. Let's just go through that. Well, I'll just do one verse. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected of men. He was not esteemed. He is despised and rejected of men in 53, 3. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. See, we didn't esteem him. He was despised and because he was despised, all those who receive him are esteemed are lifted up. That's what we want for these people that our hearts should be broken for. Broken for. Now, I, I'm not, I understand. I watch Fox News too. And my wife doesn't think my heart's broken for some of those people. I'll tell you that right now. But it should be. And it breaks my heart that it isn't at times, many times. Our hearts should break. These are people created in the image of God for his glory who know nothing about God, and we're the ones who are supposed to go do it. We're the ones who are supposed to go make it known. So Christ laid down his life for us. There's no greater love than that. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for the ungodly. And Christ was despised in the world. The world hated him, and he'll hate us as well. We're not to be surprised by that. We're not, but don't be surprised by that. We've just been spoiled in America for a long time. We need to remember one more thing to put this together. In Isaiah 53, 11 says something very interesting. And he shall see of the anguish of his soul. He shall see of the travail of his soul in the King James and shall be satisfied. He shall see his own anguish and we can see him in the garden we can see him on the cross and his own anguish. You can put yourself in a place since you bear his cross. In your own anguish, in his own anguish, he was satisfied. He was satisfied. This is out of the anguish. He was satisfied. That means as we remember, he was laid down, he laid down his life for us. He was satisfied. He was satisfied in that. As much grief and anguish that he experienced as a man, a God-man. This means, as we remember, he died for our sins. He died for our sins. He was satisfied. He was satisfied. That's why he's a lamb that doesn't speak or reject or object. Do we have things to object about? As we pull the service and reach out to people with the gospel, who really are getting quite boisterous with regard to it. Christians were almost like, you know, uh, hate crimers in their eyes. Will that hurt? Or will we be satisfied in that ministry we do, as Jesus was? It means, as we remember, he was despised. He was despised. He was hated. He was not accepted, rejected. He was satisfied. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not going to be satisfied. Unless we hold on to the one who has all authority, who is the one who died for our sins, buried, rose from the dead, who has blessed us and blesses us even now 
not only justifies us, but also brings us along the road of sanctification and draws us closer to be like him, to add these virtues in our life so that we might go forth and reach people with the glory of God. Hebrews says it this way. And then I'm going to one more thing to read and we're done. Okay? Hebrews 12, speaking of this Savior, this suffering servant who is satisfied. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. How many of you know what I'm going to push on this? Just double check it. Okay, I'm just double checking. <coughs> Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, and this is after chapter 11, the great faith chapter, and all the things that went wrong and trouble with the uh, people in the Old Testament. Wherefore, seeing we also compass about with this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And, and how do we do that? The gospel. That's how we lay aside sin. We go to the one who is the one who bears our sins. And we embrace that and it changes our heart. He said us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. There it is. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy, that, the joy, let me read that again, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before us with Christ and dwells us as a body. For the joy we endure the opposition when we go out and reach these people who need mercy and grace and instruction in the gospel and the Holy Spirit to receive it. Joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame. That means he's not going to let the shame affect him. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him, he endured this cross. Christ was despised, we are esteemed. Christ was pierced, crushed, we were healed. Christ bore our iniquities, we are counted righteous. And like the redeemed Ethiopian eunuch, we rejoice. And all, in all this, Christ rejoiced as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for these people, their patience and their love for you. And we just pray that somehow our lives, if it's not already, would be filled with the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we might grow in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might have the virtue added to us through faith in the gospel, that we might go forth and bear fruit for your glory and to bring hope in the hearts of people who are lost and desperate. We pray these things in Jesus' name.